All right, let's go ahead and open to these final, the finale. Uh, I did, was going to, someone commented, if they th maybe it should have been the great finale or a grand finale, uh, but I didn't want to raise expectations too high. So we're just going to call it the finale here. And let's go ahead and uh, just read some of the, this passage here. We're going to start with where we left off here. Remember this last half of chapter 15 and through chapter 16, Paul has invited the believers, now that they had, know what God's doing today, now that they know what God's doing with them, that God didn't, when God saved them and justified and sanctified them, he didn't uh, place them into his prophetic program with the nation of Israel. He placed them in his mystery program for the body of Christ. Now that they know all that, now that they know what God's doing today, now that they know God has changed programs, uh, now that they have all that information about God and what he's doing today, Paul, at the end of Romans 15, invites them to join together with him in prayer. And now they can go into prayer and they have something to talk with God about. They can be getting involved in God's things. They can be talking to God about the things that are important to God. Uh, the things that God prioritizes, they can prioritize in their prayer life. Now they know what God's doing. Paul invites them to join together with him in prayer in the presence of the God of peace. And that is what will trample Satan under their feet. Trample Satan and his plan of evil, uh, his... Uh, deceptions, all those little things that he does to trick people, believers up, uh, that just, just be trampled under his, our feet. Of course, the flip side of that, that's the invitation to join together with him in prayer based on everything uh, he's taught them in Romans, uh, the book of Romans through chapter 15 there. Uh, and then he gives a list of people who did just that. We said there were about 27 people there. I think it was five churches, two families, uh, and they're all involved. They all had problems just like we do. They all had health issues. They all had financial issues. They all had business problems. They all had uh, issues uh, in government issues and politics and things going on in their day. They all had the same stuff we have, and I'd suggest... Uh, probably a lot worse than any of us have had. Uh, and there they are in that list, uh, praising God. Male, female, rich, poor, uh, slave, free, they're all on that list. They're just uh, accepted Paul's invitation to join together with him in prayer and pray for the advancement of his program and how they can participate in it. Of course, the flip side of that, that's, I guess you say, the positive side, the negative side, we read in verse 17 of chapter 16, mark out and avoid those who teach contrary to what Paul taught. Uh, mark out and avoid them. Uh, and that's the avoiding, we looked at that last week, those deceptions, the trickeries uh, of Satan. And he's not doing it through the Hollywood Satan uh, or the Satan of religious systems. This is the Satan who works through men dressed to look like righteousness. Religious people, religious systems, theological systems. Uh, and he is working in that way. And we looked at that last week. Mark them out. Good, uh, fair speeches and good words. And he's being cynical there, right? Maybe sarcastic's a better word. Uh, because he follows that, they use them to deceive people. The hearts of the simple. And so we have that as a setup here. Uh, and when you're in the presence of God... Uh, worshiping and praising God together with Paul in the presence of the God of peace, and you are recognizing, able to identify and recognize and avoid those who teach contrary to Paul, that's when the God of peace tramples Satan under your feet. You're not going to fall for the de satanic deceptions. You're not going to fall uh, for deceits of teachers, false teachers. You're not going to fall for the little 2,000 years of trickeries that the vain religious system of Christianity has come up with or the theological systems of Christianity have come up to bury and cover over God's truth. Throw it away. Uh, and so now we come to this, and what's going to, trampling Satan underfoot uh, through that way, and how is that going to happen? And I think that's the best way to jump into here in these last few verses. Where does God's power come from? 
to trample Satan underfoot. Just look at verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise, I've been using the word trample, but bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Uh, and where does that power come from? Look at the end of verse 20. Uh, it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. But then look at verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So here we have this steady progression as we work our way through here. He's going to start a God of peace trampling Satan, his deceptions, his plan of evil under their feet when they embrace Pauline grace mystery truth and shun those who teach something beside that to lead them astray. He's trample Satan under their feet. The power comes from that, that uh, dispenses that is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ unto them all. And that leads to the next question. Where does the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ come from? The power comes from the grace, but where does the grace come from? Where do we find God's grace for today? And the important thing we have to realize, this fits back in with uh, of marking out and avoiding those who teach pro, uh, contrary to Pauline grace mystery truth, because what many people do is steer you to Israel's program. But you see, there's not enough grace in Israel's program for what God's doing today in the mystery program. The grace in Israel's prophetic program is the grace resident in his Jehovah name. That's the source of all those covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the new covenant, uh, the Davidic covenant, all those covenants, and we're not going to look at it today for time's sake, but we have in the past, like each one of those, in each one of those covenants, the grace that's available in those covenants isn't enough for what God's doing today. What's the Abrahamic covenant? We'll just give one example. He, uh, Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2, the Abrahamic covenant. What does it say? It says, it promises that God will save his friends and destroy his enemies. Bless those who bless him, curse those that curse him. That's the Abrahamic covenant. That's the grace in the Abrahamic covenant. That's enough grace to save the nation of Israel nationally. But you know what? That's not enough grace to save an ungodly sinner born in the world as God's enemy. If you want to know how God does that, that's revealed in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. There's not enough grace in the grace resident in his Jehovah name revealed in the non-Pauline scriptures. It's in the grace resident in Pauline grace mystery truth that all this power flows, all this uh, occurs, is made available. It's the grace of God, God lo God's love displayed at the cross of Christ, not for his friends. That's what John talked about in the Gospel of John, Christ dying for his friends. In Romans, we have Christ dying for his enemies. Infinitely greater love. There's not enough love, there's not enough grace in Israel's prophetic program to carry out what God's doing today in the dispensation of grace. That's where it's coming from, and we're going to read about that now in the next verses. Uh, so let's go and look at this next passage. We'll just read through it. And then we're going to go through it step by step. This is uh, worthwhile, I think, going into a little more depth because it's probably, as far as summary statements at least, uh, one of the most important passages in your Bible. So it's worth looking at uh, and getting this down and make sure we have it right. So let's pick it up at verse 25 and read down through verse 27. Romans 16, verse 25 through 27. Now, to him that, uh, that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now, these are the last verses. He's summer, summing everything up. He's showing you where the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is today. And therefore, he's telling us where the power is of the Lord Jesus Christ is today, but is made manifest, verse 26, but now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, uh, and we'll have to look at that phrase a little later, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only be wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever, amen. And then you have that amazing uh, benediction. Now the traditional 
uh, explanation of this passage uh, is that you have three things here. You have some thing called Paul's gospel. You have another thing called the preaching of Christ, the preaching of the mystery. And then you have a third thing, uh, the scriptures of the prophets. And the idea, the way it's traditionally taught, is if you take the first thing, uh, maybe that's how you got saved, uh, centered on the cross of Christ, you add this second thing to it called the mystery, uh, and now you can grow and mature. Uh, and then you add this third thing, the Old Testament scriptures, or in the gospel, we would include, of course, in that the gospel accounts uh, and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve. And now you have a fully edified believer. It kind of puts everything in a nice, neat little package, uh, and uh, it has a certain attractiveness because of that. It does make the Bible look like this uh, fairly nice, neat little package. And that's not wrong. Those three things, there are three things. There are, uh, you could look at it with the gospel if you just want to talk about centered on the cross, the mystery, uh, and the Old Testament scriptures. My point is I don't think that's what God and Paul are talking about here. Paul's making a much different point than just uh, that all, uh, all the scriptures can participate in our edification. Uh, he said that earlier in chapter 15. Uh, I don't think he's just saying that here. I think he's making a different point here in these last couple verses. So I'm going to look at an alternate interpretation, looking at it a little more closely uh, through the eyes of Pauline grace, mystery, truth, Paul's distinct apostleship, uh, and look at it a different way uh, and just see if this doesn't open up some things about what God's doing today. I want to give this alternate uh, uh, interpretation, explanation of this passage for a few reasons. One is, in my mind, now maybe uh, my just brain neurons can't figure this out, but I can't separate Paul's gospel and the mystery. I can't separate. No matter how I try to do it, you can't separate them, in my mind. Now, maybe I'm just not able to, to, get, to get the flow of it there. I've asked people who teach the traditional way uh, to explain how you can separate the mystery from the gospel, and they can't explain it. When they explain it, they put the two back together. You can't really, in my mind, preach those as separate things. We'll take a look at that. You'll see, uh, hopefully, that it will become clear as we're going to go through each one of these. Second of all, it confuses uh, we usually, in the traditional explanation, uh, they start out, they quote the verse with the word established. That's the word actually in the Bible on verse 25. But then when they go to their commentary, they talk about edification. So I'm going to suggest uh, that there's a difference between establishment and edification. And we'll take a look at that. Next, we're going to look at in verse 26 where it talks about manifesting. There's something very important about manifesting that we've already learned in the book of Romans uh, that will guide us and hopefully keep us from going astray uh, in verse 26. And I'd suggest here what we're going to look at is there's a difference uh, between manifesting making something known, fully revealing it, explaining and revealing all the nuts and bolts of something, and something that just witnesses to it. And we'll take a look at that when we get there. Uh, and then finally, uh, it confuses, uh, it is not actually what the, is it actually, it's not actually what the text says, uh, the traditional view. So we're going to put those together. We're just going to go through them one by one, uh, and we're going to wrap it up, uh, and then I'll have kind of a grand finale at the end. I See, I, I was saving that grand for my ending. So we'll get there. We'll get through these passages uh, and go to that. So can you really separate the preaching of Paul's gospel from the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? Are they two separate things? A lot of times people will say, They'll say uh, that Paul kind of taught the gospel in his early ministry, his early epistles, in his early ministry, but then later uh, he taught the mystery. Sometimes it's taught, uh, he taught to the, the gospel to those who weren't 
coming along as they should, the immature, the, uh, the ignorant ones, and then he taught the mystery to those who'd reach a certain level of maturity. He teaches the gospel in the Romans and Thessalonians, uh, Corinthians, Galatians, and he's teaching the mystery in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So sometimes there's that general idea. There's two different things. He teaches one, and then when you get to a certain stage, he teaches the, you the, to you the other. Uh, I'd suggest this is an error. Uh, and it goes back to the turn of the last century, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, by a writer, E.W. Bullinger, probably many people know the name, uh, who gave us many valuable, important truths, uh, re, re, uh, re, rediscovered, or however you want to put it, valuable truths. Uh, but he came up with this scheme uh, where you would, uh, Paul taught the gospel early, and then he taught the mystery later. Uh, and it, this led him into a big error. And that's why I'm kind of making an issue of this. This led him into Acts 28 dispensationalism. We're not going to fall in that uh, error. And instead, we're going to look at what Paul actually says, God and Paul actually say. So can you have the gospel without the mystery? That's a very important question because uh, even many mid-Acts dispensationalists will say, well, at least they're saved. They have the gospel. And it'd be nice if they get the mystery. That's like frosting on the cake. It's really not all that important. Uh, you know, it could affect the way they would do their Christian life, but at least they're saved. They're eternally saved. Uh, and that kind of uh, look at it. But the question is, can you separate the gospel and the mystery? And I'd suggest the answer is a definitive uh, no. Uh, when we take a look at what Paul's writings here, when at the very beginning, Paul taught his gospel, the gospel of the grace to the Gentiles. Now, you see, we're all sitting here, and we go, oh, he's teaching to the Gentiles. We're so used to this. But if you said that to a first century Jew, you know what they would have done? They would have fallen out of their chair, and they would have come after him. And if you read the book of Acts, you see that's exactly what they did. See, God wasn't supposed to be sending out his blessings to the Gentiles through some feeble old man, Jew or otherwise. He was supposed to, according to everything they have in their Bible, the Old Testament, they were supposed to be sent, God was supposed to be sending out his blessings to the Gentiles through a restored, glorious, risen nation of Israel. And now you've got Paul tramping along, he's sending them out through me. And not only that, he says, Israel has stumbled and fallen under the wrath of God. And that God set aside her program. That's the mystery. The very, the, you could, I would suggest Paul couldn't have even taught the gospel to the Jews until after he taught the mystery, the change in God's program. The, their program had been set aside. Uh, and he'd begun a new program through the Apostle Paul, whereby now he's sending out his blessings not through the rise of Israel as a nation, uh, but in, uh, through the apostleship of Paul with Israel set aside, fallen and uh, set aside. That's the mystery. You can't separate them. And I'd say in some, at least some circumstances, uh, you'd have to preach what is typically grouped together as a mystery before you even preach the gospel. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense to these Jews. How can Paul be going out with the gospel of the Gentiles? It's supposed to be going out through a restored Israel. And they would have been right to go and stone him for blasphemy. He would have had to explain the change in God's program. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made any sense to them uh, as he went out in his missionary journey. Uh, the non-Pauline scriptures, all, the only thing God had ever revealed before Paul regarding blessings going to the Gentiles was with Israel through her rise. A restored, glorious nation of Israel, the light to the Gentiles. And that is going to happen uh, when she's in her kingdom out there at Christ's return. But now you got Paul coming along and says, Israel stumbled and fallen. They're out of the pictures. God's cast them aside temporarily, but cast aside never, nonetheless. And he's raised me up. Feeble old Paul, I'm going to take his light out to the Gentiles. See, it wouldn't, if you didn't understand the mystery, the change in God's pro programs and people, it wouldn't make any sense to you.
You can't separate them, is what I guess I'm getting at here. The only way Paul could have preached the gospel of grace, especially to Jews, uh, would have been by first explaining his role in this mystery, his role uh, as an, God's apostle for today, and God's change of program, what God is doing today. Uh, it wouldn't, one would not make sense without the other. A gospel going to the Gentiles uh, through Paul when it was supposed to go through Israel wouldn't make any sense, especially to the Jews. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense. They'd say, you're, con you're not a man. If he didn't explain the change in programs, they would be right to say you're not a man of God because you're con operating contrary to God's word. And they would have been right. Take him out. Stone him. And they tried that many times. Uh, the only way, let's see, the only way uh, Paul could have preached the gospel of grace was first the mystery. Uh, and, of course, now these last 2,000 years, uh, Christianity's man-made religious systems, man-centered theological systems have had 2,000 years to try and cover that up, divide out the gospel and the mystery, uh, and uh, cause all kinds of divisions and problems within uh, true, and I'm just talking here about true believing Christianity, not even apostate Christianity, Christian name only, unbelieving Christianity, uh, but true believing Christianity. Without Paul's mystery truth, Paul's gospel truth is nothing. Uh, and it's through deceiving words, deceiving good words we read about earlier in verse 17 and 18 in chapter 16 of Romans, fair speeches that they deceive the hearts of the simple. And one of those deceptions I would suggest is getting people to think uh, that the gospel is something different than the mystery. And you will see more as we go through that. They have uh, to have the gospel and the mystery together or it doesn't work. Believing Christianity has successfully separated the mystery and the gospel. Now within believing Christianity, you have a group, uh, the most in the believing Christianity uh, think they've received the gospel and then they reject what Pauline Grace mystery truth. They reject his mystery truth. They reject his distinct apostleship. See, that division, thinking you're, you're in God's stead through the gospel, and yet you re continue to reject the mystery, see, that's a deception. That's not the way God's truth works. Uh, and that's why it's so important we get this passage right uh, in these last couple verses here. Uh, and so when we, we're going to look at some of the earliest churches here and answer this question. Did Paul ever teach the gospel separately from the mystery? And we're going to go all the way back to his earliest epistle, and we're going to ask the question, did Paul ever teach something called the gospel, and that was then later would teach something called the mystery, and together edified the assembly? I going to tell you right of advance, I think we're going to see the answer is no. So go to second, or first Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. And we're just going to look here. I wrote out here some verses. We're not going to develop these. I'm just going to read you where he talks about the gospel. So look at verse one, chapter 1, verse 5. First Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. So here we have our gospel came unto them in word only, but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit. So here we have the power. Remember Romans 16, 25? This is at the power to establish you. Uh, here we get reference to that power, that gospel. And he says our gospel, Paul's gospel. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. But even that after we had suffered and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God, which with much contention. Look at verse 4. But we, are, we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. God gave Paul. He entrusted the gospel to Paul. Verse uh, 8. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but our own souls. Verse 9, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel. 
So he's preaching the gospel the whole time here. He's referring back to when they were there in person, and now in his, his epistle, he's reviewing that. So we know what he was talking about. At his early, one of the, his earliest stops and his earliest missionary journeys, he's preaching the, what he calls the gospel all over the place. Over and over in these first verses. Go down to, verse, go to chapter 3 just to get uh, another example a little further out in the epistle. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. And sent Timothy, remember, who do we just read about in Romans 16, I think it was verse 21, uh, Timothy. Timothy's one of those guys that successfully, that God successfully trampled Satan under his feet because he joined together with Paul in prayer in the presence of the God of peace and prayed and talked with God about ways Paul's apostleship could be advanced. And then he participated in it. He was there at the beginning of the second missionary journey. He went with Paul all the way through all the trials, all the tribulations, all the persecution. He's still there at the end of the third missionary journey. He's with him in prison when he's in the Roman prison, and he's with him in 2 Timothy when he, Paul writes to Timothy, all have turned away from me. Timothy's still there. That's a Timothy. And what's the role of a Timothy? 1 Corinthians 4, I think, verse 20. Timothy's only role. Uh, Timothy is another word for pastor. If you want to know if your pastor is a Timothy and a God-appointed uh, spokesman for him today, read 1 Corinthians 4, I think it's verse 20, if not right around there. Be ye followers of Paul. And he, I send Timothy to remind everybody in every church in every location of everything Paul taught. That's a Timothy, that's a pastor, that's a deacon and elder. If they're not doing that, they're a false Timothy. And he's going to send Timothy here. This is probably earlier than we saw previously, verse 2. And send Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you. There's our word again. Establish. Remember Romans 16, 25, the power to establish you according to my gospel? Uh, For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. All right. So I just wanted to bring out, you see he's been teaching to the Thessalonians, preaching to them, my gospel, my gospel, my gospel. All the way through, all the way the first three as recorded in these first three chapters. But now, let's look at something else. Let's go back and let's pick it up at verse, 15, uh, verse 14. For ye brethren, now let's just keep in mind one thing. What's the only way before Paul the Gentiles could be blessed? It was with Israel and through her rise, her glorious rise, and through she'd be the light to the Gentiles. But now look how Paul's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which is in Judea, uh, Judea are in, that are in Christ, For ye have also suffered like things unto your countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Uh, So they're like the believing remnant in Jerusalem, just like the believing remnant in Jerusalem. They're suffering persecution at the hands of the Israel's Jews. Uh, Now the believers in Thessalonica are suffering at the hands of especially the Jewish uh, unbelievers in Thessalonica. So in that way, they're related to that assembly in Jerusalem, who both... Now he's talking about the, what the status of Israel at this point, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. Now why were they forbidding them to speak to the Gentiles? Well, it's because in Israel's program, it's, the Gentiles aren't supposed to be spoken to through some feeble old man, Jew or otherwise, they were supposed to be spoken to through a risen, restored, glorious nation of Israel. But how is Paul preaching to the Gentiles? He's preaching to those who killed the Lord Jesus Christ, who killed the prophets, who are persecuting his spokesmen, who are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, 
Does that sound like uh, a restored nation of Israel shining the light of God throughout the world? It says they're, they're in ruin under the wrath of God. That's the mystery. You can't separate the gospel and the mystery. It wouldn't make any sense. They go together. The mystery is that God set aside the nation of Israel, and he's sending out his blessings now through the apostleship of Paul and going out to the Gentiles. So no, they didn't, the, uh, the, the, they were taught uh, mystery truth uh, along with the preaching. They, in other words, they, when he preached the gospel, he was also preaching the mystery. They have to, they could, it goes together. Otherwise, he's automatically, if God didn't change programs, that's the mystery, I guess you could summarize it, then Paul had no right to preach the gospel. It's as simple as that. And they were right to forbid him to speak based on their scriptures. God started something new, though. That's the mystery truth. In addition, of course, uh, at the end of this epistle, we have a wonderful mystery truth, the rapture given, the rapture of the body of Christ. Uh, and so there's another mystery truth. So in his very earliest epistle, when, and he's referring back to what he taught them in person before that even, the m- preaching of the gospel was equal w- to the preaching of the mystery. They go, they're together. They're not separate. They're one th- item. Preach one, preach the other. Let's see if that's true in some other places. We'll look at these a little more quickly. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Here's another early epistle. 1 Corinthians, verse, chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Uh, and verse 18, for the preaching of the cross. So you got the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the cross. Uh, look down at verse 18. For that, is, uh, for that in the wisdom of God. Now, we won't turn there, but what do you, I hope everyone remembers, what does Paul say at the end of explaining the mystery in Romans 11? What does he call it? He calls it the wisdom of God. I think it's Romans 11.35. Uh, we won't turn there, but you can see that. The wisdom of God. He's preaching. In preaching the wisdom of God, he's preaching the mystery. Just a few chapters before this in Romans, he calls it. The mystery is the wisdom of God. Here he's preaching the cross, preaching the gospel. He's preaching the wisdom of God, which he's already explained in Romans, is the preaching of the mystery. And we could keep going through that whole passage. We'll pick it up over in chapter 2 now. Verse uh, 2. For I determined not to know anything, anything among you save Jesus and him crucified. Uh, so does that mean he didn't teach the mystery? You know, that's what it's usually taught. These were uh, carnal Christians. They weren't mature enough to understand the mystery. Uh, so they got to get up with the program. Then they'd learn the mystery. No, uh, because we've just showed when he's preaching the cross, he's preaching the gospel, he's preaching the wisdom of God, he's preaching the mystery. And he's going to say it explicitly. Keep going. Let's read down uh, verse oh, 05. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We're back to Romans 8, uh, 16, 25. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to nothing. But, verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. You're back to the mystery. Preaching the gospel, preaching, uh, preaching the cross, preaching Christ, preaching uh, the wisdom of God is at the same time preaching the mystery. They're one package. They are one thing. To preach one without the other uh, would bring confusion. Then we can go to the book of Romans. Uh, does the Romans... Uh, only, you know, sometimes it's taught Romans is the gospel. I've actually seen commentary set up this way, you know, whole Bible commentary. Romans is about the gospel, uh, and Ephesians is about the mystery. Is that true? Are they really separate? Has Paul separated them out? We'll go to Romans 1. How does the whole book open? Romans 1, verse 5. By whom... We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That's the mystery. 
Paul is, as I've said 14 times this morning, Paul isn't supposed to be taking God's light out to the world. Israel's supposed to be doing that. The nation of Israel is supposed to be doing that. But Paul opens this passage with the revelation God's raised him up to do something uh, that wasn't revealed before. He's raised him up to take his light out to the Gentiles, his salvation, his blessings. The book opens with that. We just read it. The book closes with that. We, that's what we read in Romans 16, 25. And the book is centered on the mystery Chapters 9 to 11, uh, it's all about the mystery and the setting aside of the nation of Israel, beginning a new program for the body of Christ called this mystery program. The whole book of Romans begins with the mystery, ends with the mystery, is permeated throughout with mystery truth, and is centered on the mystery. You can't have one without the other. So it seems evident uh, that uh, from his earliest teachings, they were never separated. So where did the separation come along? See, I think that's a good question. We think of them as separated. Even within dispensational th circles, we think of them as separated. Well, how did they get separated? If they weren't separated in Paul's teachings, where did they get separated? Well, they got separated in the teachings of man-made religious systems and man-made theological systems that separated them out. And ultimately, uh, we can, if we go back in Romans, let's go back to Romans 16 now. Romans 16, we just read uh, about how Satan deceives through f good words and fair speeches, Romans 16, 17, and 18, to deceive the simple. I'd suggest this is one of those satanic deceptions that have entered. The Satan is getting us to divide apart. If he can get us to divide apart the gospel and the mystery, uh, then we'll have the state of current Christianity. They have a large uh, amount of believing Christianity. They think they're embracing the gospel, but they've rejected the thing called the mystery. Paul's distinct apostleship, this new dispensation of grace. But you can't. It doesn't matter what they think. God, the way God thinks is they go together. The fact, all those people who don't agree, have rejected Pauline grace, mystery, truth, have rejected the mystery, but think they're saved because uh, they believe this thing they call the gospel. All those people, uh, none of them today, you go to any of those churches, none of them have a lamb slung over their shoulder. None of them are worshiping, worshiping in the way uh, that Israel worshiped. None of them. There's been a change in pro Whether they acknowledge it and understand the ramifications is irrelevant. Satan has come in at, from the very earliest days and has gotten historic Christianity to start dividing the gospel and the mystery. They're one and the same thing. You can't preach one without the other. They're the same thing. Whether people understand it and can vocalize an explanation is, is beside the point. The point is, the mystery, and the, when you're preaching the gospel, he's preaching the mystery. So let's go back to Romans 16, 25. All right, now let's go to the second thing. So you, these can't be divided. So when we read this passage, uh, we'll have to take this into account that it can't be divided. So let's go to chapter 16. Now with all that background, now you come to chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that has a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So now you have a word and there. In English or Greek, it doesn't matter and can have many different ways of being interpreted. The two big ways are and in the sense of additive, one and two is three, but and can also be explanatory and is used throughout the Bible, throughout Romans, throughout every passage in this way as well where, uh, and sometimes the King James even recognize and translate as even. It's an explanatory and. It's a, uh, it's a, a even or that is. And I'd suggest that's the sense of and in this passage. It's not additive and, the gospel plus something called the mystery equal one, equal two things put together. Rather, it's uh, the gospel and in the sense of even that is the preaching of Jesus Christ. 
according to the revelation of the mystery. And a perfect example of this was once, I remember someone came up to me and had this very perplexed look on his face, and they said, how come whenever Pastor Peter talks about the 12, he always says Peter and the 11? But when you talk about the 12, you always say Peter and the 12. What's the answer? Well, it's because I'm using, we're using and differently. Peter's using and, he's saying one guy named Peter and together with 11 guys named, uh, well, I'm not gonna go through their names, I probably couldn't anyway, and to form a group of individuals called the 12. Now, I'm using it a little different. I'm using it in the sense of even, that is, as Peter being the representative of the whole group. Well, that's what I think this is talking about here, too. Uh, it's a perfect, I'm not pulling this use of and out of thin air. It's used this way in all times. This is the go Paul's gospel and in the sense of that is the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. They go together. They're one and the same thing. To preach one, to preach God's, the gospel of the grace of God going out to Gentiles today is that at the, you're preaching at the same time, whether people recognize it or not is irrelevant, but you're preaching at the same time God's changed programs that's making his grace available to the world today through the apostleship of Paul. And so I think that's uh, the main thrust of this. The next thing we're going to look at uh, is the traditional explanation I think confuses establishment and edification. The Greek word for establish is sterizo. Its primary meaning is to make, fa make fast, fix, set in place. A uh, dictionary I have gave an example. He set the stone fast in the ground. It refers to being fixed to a solid grounding, anchored to a foundation. Uh, and then from this, of course, secondary meanings come out, strengthening, confirming, that kind of thing. In Paul's writings, uh, establish is only used six times. It's only used six times in all of Paul's writings, and all six of them are in transition period epistles. We've just read two, 16, Romans 16, 25, and over in uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. Uh, we got the first thing there. They're only used when Paul is in the process of laying the foundation, the transition period epistles. They're foundation teachings. Uh, and they're in their, I have the other ones listed out here. We're not going to turn to them. Remember, and we were, just came out of Romans 15, and where does Romans 15 say? He says, Paul's standing, we put him up on a mountain, and he's looking and he explaining to Romans about his foundation that he's laid. And he says, I've laid my foundation from going west of Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum all the way virtually to Italy, uh, and now what he wants to do is cross the Adriatic Sea and go to Italy and Rome. His foundation has been laid through the whole Eastern Roman Empire. The foundation is there. It's established. He's laid it. He's put it in place. And that's uh, the establishment aspect. It's only in his early epistles while he's laying this foundation. You get to the other epistles and the foundation is there. And then, in his later epistles, what do you do on a foundation? You build on it. I'm a little embarrassed uh, to say where I got the inspiration for this. Maybe I shouldn't admit this. Uh, I was sitting there doing what everybody's mother says don't do, especially these days, flipping through the TV channels. And I landed on this show, Emerald Live. Has anyone seen Emerald Live? And we all know some of uh, Emerald's little sayings. Sometimes they're kind of catchy. Uh, and I was inspired by Emerald for this section. Uh, and I know some of you are now going through your head, what were those famous Emerald things? Bam, remember he'd put some salt in and go bam. You can see I like Emerald. Uh, or what was the other thing he said? He'd, he'd spice things up or brown it a little too, too long and he'd go, we're gonna kick it up a notch. Well, neither of those things are what I heard him say that inspired this. Uh, those, those are pretty good things. What he said here, uh, he got down on his counter, and you know how he does, and just kind of talks to you, and he says, you got, now he's building a dish, right, a, a food dish. You got to lay the foundation before you build the structure. And he just looked, and I'm like, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to steal that. And so I stole it, and here, that's why I'm here. Uh, 
You have to lay the foundation and then you build the structure. Now, isn't it interesting? You flip over just two pages in my Bible to chapter 3 in Corinthians and look what he's talking about. He's talking to the Corinthians. He's explaining what he's done. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, past tense, and another buildeth thereon, and others are going to come and build on it. And they better watch how they build. you got to lay the foundation before you build the structure. Uh, and I'd suggest edify, establish is laying the foundation. Edify is building on the foundation, on the structure. And whereas in establishment, in establishment, uh, only Paul's epistles, well, we'll look at that at the next thing. So we'll pick that, go on to the next thing. That leads us into the next thing, uh, the di- going from the difference between uh, establishment and, ed- and edification. Now we get the difference between manifesting and witnessing. Look at verse 26. But now is made manifest. Uh, so what's made manifest? What's manifest, uh, reveal completely, completely reveal in all the nuts and bolts, explain fully, uh, manifest, uh, and it's being manifested. Well, it's this Paul's gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that he just talked about. But let's look at one other thing, see where it all started in Romans 3. Romans 3, look at verse 21, very important verse to help us in our passage here. Romans 3, verse 21, but now, so when he says, but now, does he mean it was before or even after? No, it's through his apostleship, what God's accomplishing through his apostleship. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested through Paul's apostleship, through Paul's preaching uh, of the gospel, uh, preaching of the, Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The, this is something, that God, the difference between manifesting and witnessing, only Paul's teaching is manifesting this, making it known, revealing it. The Old Testament scriptures, all they can do, according to Romans 3.21, is witness to it. They can't manifest it. They didn't, it was a secret. It says that in the, the, just in our verse before this, back in Romans 16, 25, it was kept secret since the world began. So are you going to be able to go to the Old Testament and get it? No. You have to go to the but now, the scriptures of Paul, to get it. Uh, and Paul is the one who manifests what God's doing today. The other scriptures witness to it. They can witness to the, uh, to the, nature of God, to the nature of sin, to the nature of sinners. They can witness to the fact that by the works of the law, no one can be justified. They can even witness to the fact, Abraham's the example of justification by grace through faith. They can witness to all those things, but they cannot manifest it. They can't fully reveal it. They can't make it known. They can't explain how it all works. Uh, They can't do any of that. All they can do is witness to it. Uh, if this was a ball game, Paul's scriptures are down on the field playing the game. Paul's group is down there playing. The Old Testament scriptures are on the sidelines and up in the stands cheering him on. They can witness, but they can't manifest. Uh, and so that leads us to the, to the next thing. Uh, to summarize then, while the non-Pauline scriptures... Uh, have this secondary person, a uh, purpose, uh, they can witness to Paul, God's revelation through Paul. Only Paul's revelation can manifest, fully reveal, make known what God's doing today. The Old Testament scriptures can witness and they can say that's in accord with God's nature, that's in accord with God's holiness, that's in accord with God's justice. They can witness in that way. Paul scriptures are what manifest them. And that leads us uh, back to the final thing here as I wrap this up. What does the text actually say? Now, this one uh, is pretty important to me. 
So what does the text actually say? So now we've gone from manifesting. What can manifest? We realize now the Old Testament can't manifest. Only Paul's epistles can manifest. So now when we get, go back to verse 26, Romans 16, 26. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. But now is made manifest this preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which is now made manifest, made known. Now, if it meant and the scriptures of the prophets, uh, he'd have to be contradicting what he said earlier. Because we learned earlier the Old Testament prophets, with the scriptures of the prophets of the Old Testament, couldn't manifest what God's doing today. They could only witness to it. But God and Paul use the word manifest. They don't use the word witness. So that phrase cannot refer to the Old Testament prophets. And if you, you know the answer, if you have a New King James Version, uh, the New King James has corrected that. And what does it say there? It's the, the prophetic scriptures. There is a big difference between the scriptures of the prophets, which would be the Old Testament prophets, and the prophetic scriptures. Now here's the question. Uh, all the Bible is prophetic scriptures. So it's going to force you to ask another question that the King James prevents you from asking. It forces you to ask the next question, well, whose prophetic scriptures? And since we just learned about manifesting and we just learned that everything this he's referring to here was kept secret since the world began, it can't be the prophets of the Old Testament or Christ's earthly ministry or the ministry of Peter and the Twelve. It has to be the prophetic scriptures of Paul, not least of which being this epistle to Rome, this foundational doctrine as put forth in the book of Romans. So uh, the New King James has corrected it to prophetic scriptures. It's not, it, remember, Paul was a prophet. He's called a prophet. Uh, the prophets of the Old Testament were the many prophets of Israel. Paul is the one prophet and apostle for the body of Christ. His scriptures are as prophetic as anyone else's. He was a prophet, a spokesman for God. And so when you now read through this passage, uh, this is how I would suggest uh, we're to understand it in the light of all Paul's teachings, all Paul's epistles, the whole book of Romans. Now to him that has a power to establish you according to my gospel and in the sense of even, or that is, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is manifested by Paul's ministry and apostle and by the pro prophetic scriptures of Paul, namely, especially this letter to the Romans, according to the commandment of the everlasting God who had, and who had before kept it secret is now made known to all nations for obedience of the faith, the whole world especially, the Gentiles today in the dispensation of grace, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And that's my conclusion to the book of Romans. Uh, if this were uh, a rock concert, this would be the time I'd come and whack my guitar on the stage. I don't have a guitar, I have a piano, but I don't think that would work. Getting it here might be a bit of a chore. Uh, and I also, thought I had a pastor once who ended his message, and he, he must have been mad about something, I don't remember what it was, but he took his fist and whang the podium, the pulpit, uh, and it split in two. It was the power of God, I guess. Uh, and I thought, well, I could try that, but then I remembered this podium's metal and his was just wood. So I figured I better not do that either. So I'm just going to close uh, by saying a couple things here. Inviting an invitation, just like Paul does uh, at the end of, in, the mid, in Romans 15, inviting them into his prayer life. Uh, if there's any unsaved out there listening to this message, 
I would just ask you to reconsider. Romans explained that the infinitely holy and just and righteous God did something amazing for you. He displayed his amazing, infinite love for you and uh, through the work of his son on that cross who went there to die for you, not when you dressed yourself up, that's what religion says, but when you went, he died for you when you were an ungodly sinner on enemy status before him, freeing you to receive the grace of salvation, eternal life, righteousness, freely by grace, simply on the basis of faith. He did all that. The God of eternity, the creator God of the universe, went to that cross, took all your sin, all your guilt, all the shame, freeing you to accept his gift. Receive it by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To those who are believers, uh, but who continue to reject much of God's truth for today, Pauline Grace Mystery Truth and his distinct apostleship, uh, I beseech you, I, I beg you, I beseech you to reconsider as well. Uh, it may look like these Romans truths are trying to take something away, uh, but they're not. They're trying to give you something real. The things you're holding on to now aren't real. Uh, my wife always calls it the teddy bears. Uh, they're not real. They're not really effective. They're not going to do what you need them to do when you need them to do it. God's truth, uh, yes, wants you to get rid of those, but he doesn't just leave you empty-handed. He wants to fill you up with infinitely greater blessings and involve you in something of infinitely and eternal value that never ends, never leaves, never never, uh, reduces. Apart from Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, uh, nothing is really real or true. It's just a mirage. Uh, They've most of historic Christianity has replaced uh, the true prayer of Pauline Grace Mystery Truth that flows out of Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, just pagan superstition. Uh, They've replaced uh, the real love uh, of God, the true love of God, with just a human love at the best. Uh, They've replaced uh, the acceptable service to God with just uh, unacceptable service, not holding, and I remember a deacon, and he explains to Timothy, is someone who doesn't, isn't just grave, doesn't drink a lot, doesn't do all, is someone who holds the mystery with a clear conscience. If you think you're serving to God today and you're not holding the mystery with a clear conscience, I suggest you're fooling yourself. Now, to those who are part of the grace movement, I don't have slides for these, so I'm just going to re- read off here. Those who are already part of the grace movement, and this is where I'm going to make my biggest appeal, I beseech you, I'll go farther, I beg, I plead, I'll get down on my hands and knees and cry if you want me to. Don't add anything to Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. Nothing. It'll always ruin it. It'll always diminish it. Uh, Anything added to Pauline Grace Mystery Truth uh, eventually diminishes and makes it disappear. Uh, And unless you think, uh, I'm not a young whippersnapper. You see, you could. If I was a young whippersnapper, you could say he doesn't know what he's talking about. But unfortunately for all you here and all on the internet and on Zoom and every place else that might hear this, uh, I'm an old timer and I've been around the bend way too many times. And this is where I'm going to end, where I began my first message in Romans, given my little introduction of myself. Uh, And I'm going to start with exactly the same phrase I started back then. I was fortunate to grow up in a grace church, a big grace church. I love that church. I love that pastor. Everything I'm saying this morning, there is nothing personal. I love that pastor more than any to this day. I love that pastor more than anyone here can even imagine. But that church decided Pauline Grace Mystery Truth wasn't quite enough. They needed more people and more pews and more money, so they hired some professionals to come in and to run a music program and a theater program, and they had people to run programs all day long for every age group, and there was always something to do, and guess what happened? They did, it worked, they brought them in. I think there were 12 or 1,500 people there on a Sunday. They were, they were just coming from miles around. 
But guess what also happened? Pauline Grace Mystery Truth was discarded. It was forgotten. It was buried. It was disposed of. And not long after that, uh, that Grace Pastor was kicked out. I've been around the bend. Don't add anything to Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. Then I went to another church, so I have a second church, and I love that church too, and I loved everybody there, and I love that pastor. This is nothing personal. And he had such a way of cutting through everything and getting right to that grace message that made people force them to either uh, to understand it and to force them to make a decision on it. But unfortunately there, pretty soon the grace message wasn't enough. And in this case, they added politics and gun control stance and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, and pretty soon, guess what wasn't talked about much? Not much about grace, a lot about politics. And guess what happened to that church? Poof, self-destructed. I remember being in charge of editing tapes there. And they'd want all the political stuff edited out, so just the Bible stuff remained. Some of those tapes, two 45-minute sessions, and some all that remained were like five minutes of Bible teaching and two 45-minute sessions. Pretty soon, you add anything to grace. The other thing is going to bury it and throw it away. Now, you say, that'd probably be enough for me to learn my lessons. No, I went to a third grace church. I went to a third grace church, uh, and uh, I went there, and I love that grace church. I love that pastor, and I love everybody there. I taught there for a little while, uh, and uh, everybody would come at the end, and they'd just praise, talk about grace and how wonderful Christ worked on the cross and everything was. But then uh, this church didn't think that was enough. So they added King James Version only to it. And now all of a sudden I'd finished my teaching and people didn't care about Christ and grace anymore. They want to know my stance on King James Version only controversy. More division. Don't add anything to Pauline Grace mystery truth. Don't add anything. Then, now you'd say I probably should have just given up by now, right? No, I didn't give up. I went to a fourth church, my fourth Grace Church. And it was a church in a city called Rolling Meadows, called Grace uh, Bible Church of Rolling Meadows. I was a little sarcastic, since I maybe a little cynical. Uh, I went there wondering what's this pastor going to be replacing grace with, or adding grace to, or adding to grace, ruining grace. But guess what happened? I went week after week, and month after month, and before long it was a year or two. And you know what this pastor kept doing? He kept preaching grace. Thank you, Pastor Peter Philippi. You saved my life, and I know you've saved the lives of many people looking for God's truth. And I'm so thankful <clears throat> for this assembly. So that's my history. I've been around the bend, uh, and I can even go from here. If you're a, if you're a Bible society who has a beloved founder uh, and you're clinging to those truths as those, those are the words of God, that founder gave us a lot of good things, but now as new uh, truth and new understanding comes along, you have to change some of those things. Like, for instance, how Old Testament saints are saved. That is the biggest, biggest detriment to uh, talking to reformed and covenant theologians. You need to fix that doctrine. Don't cling to it just because your founder uh, clings to it, clung to it. Straighten out that doctrine. If you're working on some other project, set that project aside, you gotta work on that one. Unless you think I'm God, I can pick out everybody's other's errors, I'll just tell you every morning I get up uh, and I just pray to God that if there's anything, and I close the night with this too, if there's anything I'm adding to grace, to teach it to me, show it to me, rip it off me no matter how much it hurts, and just let me preach grace. Uh, and that's what I strive to do. I've told the board here, uh, I've actually given my signed letter of resignation. If I ever start teaching anything else, just get rid of me. I've been around the bend too many times.
And uh, I would just pray that nobody ever add anything to grace. You're not going to fill a coliseum. You're not going to draw in all the people who want sports and programs and all the socialization. But you're going to remain uh, firm with God's truth. And on that note, we'll close uh, out the study, the official study of Romans uh, in prayer. Heavenly Father,